Thank you very much. Can you hear me from this? Okay, very good. So I'll keep this handy here. <laughs> so, as I mentioned earlier at the opening ceremony, language is extremely important in today's world. But one aspect that we always forget, because we put all our emphasis into learning the linguistic side, is the business side of language. And there is a booming business side, a side that has created li livelihood for many people around the world, both linguists and translators, interpreters, but also business people, salespeople, technology engineers, and it has proliferated with the digitization of e-commerce and all other businesses to become global. So the side of the business uh, uh, of the language is very, very important. And today we're going to spend a little bit of time in the morning understanding all the concepts. We may go a little bit slower so we get the fundamentals right. So feel free to ask any questions. If there are any terms that you're not 100% sure and I haven't explained them fully, please let me know so we can cover all the important things. If for any reason something has escaped you, please do talk to me um, or to the assistants during the breaks. So um, you already heard my bio and how I've been in the industry for quite some time. I wanted to share with you a couple of little things that are not part usually of the bio. So the first thing is, if you know the uh, American expression, when somebody doesn't understand something, an American will say, it's all Greek to me, meaning something is very difficult, okay? Now, I am Greek, so I can't say, and no Greek will ever say, it's all Greek to me, because we speak the language very well. So I wanted to share with you, what do you think we say? We say, it's all Chinese to me. <laughs> because for us, Chinese is the most difficult language. So for the, the rest of the world, Greek is probably a little bit less difficult than Chinese, <laughs> but for us Greeks, Chinese is definitely the top. Another thing I wanted to share with you before we go on is about our two languages and our two cultures. Both the Greek culture and the Chinese culture are very ancient, and we have languages that are full uh, of cultural significance. Uh, we also, both our languages are very difficult to learn. One of the things that uh, we, uh, uh, you are very lucky to have is that your language is alive and you are able to pronounce uh, the words exactly the same way your ancestors were pronouncing it. For us Greeks, this is different. Greek is, uh, ancient Greek is not known how it was pronounced. Um, how many of you know what the word diphthong is? Diphthong is when you put two vowels together. So you have an e, a, and an e, and that makes a different sound. Mm -hmm. So in Greek, in ancient Greek especially, we have something like 10 different e's, and each of these e's is written differently. However, today, we don't know how to pronounce those different 10 e's. <laughs> So that is why we call it a dead language, because it, it is not spoken anymore. However, ancient Greek is not dead, because its culture and the language and the taxonomy of science is still based on the ancient Greek language. So let's move on a little bit and get into our topic, which is globalization. How many of you are aware of what these acronyms are? Let me see your hands. Any, anyone aware? Very few, so I will explain. <laughs> the first one of the Russian doll is globalization. And the second one starts with an I and finishes with an N and is in... Oh, you need me closer. Okay. Okay, I shall do this then, if you excuse me. I will do this. 
Okay. This is better? Is this better? Yes. Okay, we got it. <laughs> okay, so the first one is globalization. And uh, you can see that it starts with a G, finishes with an N. Second one is internationalization. Starts with an I, finishes with an N. Next one is localization. Starts with an L, finishes with an N. And finally, translation. Starts with a T, finishes with an N. Does anybody know what the numbers are? Exactly. So. This is how you can write this, big words very, very quickly. And some people actually don't even say internationalization because it is so difficult to say, even for Americans. So they just say I-18N. <laughs> and that's completely understood within our industry, but to nobody else. So if you're going to use I-18N, make sure that the other people know what you're talking about. So what I want to say about this uh, slide is that we have the Russian dolls here. And you can see that one goes inside the other and inside the other and so on because each of them are interdependent. Okay? Now, let's start from the small translation. This is what we do as linguists. Okay? But translation is used by localization. And localization is when we take a product and we make it local using our translation. And then this product, which has been localized, belongs to a company. And this company has many localized versions. But in order to localize a version, they have to have one template which is neutral from localization. And that is the internationalization concept. And finally, all of this belongs into the category of globalization, which is a financial uh, strategy for the company. And as you can see, I talked to you about translation going into localization, into internationalization, into globalization. This is what we call a bottom-up concept. Okay. But in order for us as linguists to be more understanding of what our companies and what our clients are trying to do, we need to start looking at this concept top down. So we're going to start today's lecture with globalization to understand what is the financial aspects that drive a company to want to sell their product elsewhere. So yes, of course, they want to make money. They want to have more users if it's a platform. They want to have more brand awareness. They want to be a monopoly. That's what every organization wants to do. But besides that, it is how they are going to do it which determines the globalization strategy. And those companies that understand that they have a globalization strategy are going to start by saying what does our product need to be like in order for us to be able to speak the same language and to attract users in different countries. And this is where the engineers are going to have to design the digital product in such a way so it can then be easily localized and changed for every locale. And that is the basics of internationalization. Finally, they have agents in the various countries, they have their own offices sometimes, and they have their own marketing people. And this small team, the local team, is going to say to the company, this is how, what we need to do for this product to be successful in this country. And this is how we're going to adapt it. So this is where localization comes in. And finally, when everything is all set and the strategy is in place, it comes for translation, which is, as we all know, the implementation of all these strategies. But as I said in the opening <coughs> ceremony, it's good for us to know the entire chain and not just do our work. Because when we do our work on a daily basis and we have the understanding of why they have given us this text this way, then we can 
adapt and help them and give them exactly what they want and have happy customers. So let's move to what is globalization. Globalization is a vast concept and it's not new at all. So it's the process of interaction and integration amongst different people, companies, and governments worldwide. Okay? The concept of globalization has had so much debate, and so many definitions. There is not one single definition that everybody agrees with globalization. Mostly because as a subject, it's extremely uh, vast. It touches upon every aspect of our lives. Um, and then finally, there are, there are ways of differentiating globalization based on what type of it. Is it cultural? Is it economic? Is it technological? I want to ask you, does anybody know our translation? Where does, is there a, a word for our translation for globalization? You probably will not know this, but it is mostly we're dealing with product globalization. Okay? This is important to differentiate because when you look at the concept of globalization, it starts with economics. And economics, as you know, is a very big topic. You can have macroeconomics, meaning the big picture. Or you can have microeconomics, which means the organization. So globalization touches everything. And when we are talking about it, we don't talk about technological or economical. We don't talk about trade agreements. We only talk about product globalization. <coughs> the benefits of globalization are many. A lot of people have a lot of criticisms as well. And overall, quite a lot of the criticism are correct. And there are different circumstances around the world. However, the benefits of globalization outweigh a lot of the criticism. And this is generally understood. And also the fact that if it wasn't good for us, this would not have persevered. <laughs> but as we are today, we are moving at a rapid, rapid pace of globalization. Now, this means open communications. It means a lot more cultural to toleration, adaptation, changes. It also means that different cultures, different peoples can take the best of their cultures and integrate it with others. That is going to benefit the world. Of course, that is the theory. The actual way of looking at globalization in a very, very simple way is that it is the process by which a business starts operating on an international scale, which means that every time a local business, let's say a manufacturer, does export, that is the beginning of that company's globalization strategy. I would like to share with you a very short video which is done by a professor at Penn State, an American uh, university. And in three minutes, this professor is able to give us the whole highlights of globalization. We don't need to worry about any of the details, he says, but it's good for us to know what it is. I need to exit. <coughs> Yeah, I'll need your help. <laughs> I need to go back one. Thank you. I stay here, stay here, because we'll need to. The term globalization refers to an increasingly interconnected nature of international trade and is driven by technology and government policies designed to open free trade. This expansion of markets beyond domestic economies has brought many benefits to nations around the globe. Firms increasingly have access to consumers around the globe, and access to new resources can help lower costs. Globalization can boost economic development in poorer countries and help raise standards of living. Outsourcing by large corporations can bring new jobs and technologies to these nations, 
which boosts their economy. The result can be viewed as higher economic efficiency via globalization and free trade. Free trade agreements are agreements that allow participating nations to trade without tariffs or quotas. The most notable example of this type of agreement for the United States is the North American Free Trade Agreement, known as NAFTA. A trade agreement signed into law involving Canada, the United States, and Mexico. A more integrated version of a free trade agreement is called an economic union. In an economic union, member nations often have free trade agreements to common trade policy with nations outside the union and coordinate their monetary and fiscal policies. The best example of an economic union is the European Union, a union of 28 European member states. Free trade agreements are designed to reduce barriers to trade and allow nations to gear trade towards their comparative advantages. This leads to higher economic activity, higher overall wage levels, and attainment of a level of goods and services that would ordinarily be outside the production possibilities frontier. Overall, free trade agreements lower costs and dead weight loss via increased efficiency. Some criticisms of free trade agreements are valid. These agreements can lead to poor working conditions as international companies outsource jobs to cheaper labor markets in emerging market countries where there is less regulation. Larger countries may lose jobs to outsourcing, and one of the greatest criticisms of NAFTA was the loss of U.S. jobs to Mexico. Free trade may also lead to depletion of natural resources as emerging market countries engage in strip mining and deforestation practices in the absence of environmental protections. Globalization and free trade allow producers to best utilize their comparative advantages. This leads to increased trade, leads to an increased demand for productive workers, and causes the average level of wages in an economy to rise. However, this does not mean that everybody benefits and that all wages rise. Workers whose industries are exporting more in the global market will see their wages increase because of demand, but workers who are in an industry that sees increased competition and in imports from global markets may see their wages decrease. Many nations have poor working conditions, and economists must analyze whether the trade makes the nation better off, and whether this type of production gives citizens better job opportunities. For example, the outsourcing of a service job to a country that pays low wages may seem like a detriment to the worker who takes the job. But what if the alternative is that service job was unsafe factory work that paid less? The outsourcing of the service job increased the standard of living through higher wages and increased job safety. Okay, so you saw the concepts of globalization and now you can understand why governments are evolved, trade agreements, um, it's the cultural issue, it's political, it, it is a lot more important than the product globalization that we deal with. But in order for a company, an organization, to come to a decision that they will create their product globalized, they need to have done all of this before. They have to have import, export, licenses, compliances, many, many things. So when it comes to us, there has been a huge chain of events that has come before. And it's important for us to understand that perhaps the reason that we are the last bit is, and we're considered an implementation is because all of this has happened and it was very, very difficult to get to this stage. Now that we know it though, we can put a lot more understanding into it and perhaps we can react to our clients with that understanding and explain to them how we can do our job better by being involved at earlier stages and advising them through the process or through some of the processes. So you can see here that a big organization is not just gonna have one strategy. An organization is going to have what we call a strategic framework. That is multiple strategies that are interconnected. They even have a mapping of how they are connected, which one falls under which one. So to be precise with our globalization, you will see that we have 
an international growth strategy. That international growth strategy in itself is part of a bigger strategy for an organization. But for our purposes today, we're going to start at this and not at the very, very top level. So you can see we have the marketing strategy at the same level with the globalization strategy. The marketing is creating brand awareness. It's teaching people how to uh, need the product. And it is working in various countries to understand who are the users of the product, who are the clients, who are the buyers. And the globalization strategy is facilitating that marketing. So they're all working interconnected. Under the marketing strategy, they can have other strategies. For example, competition strategy, how they're going to outweigh their competition. They could have a content strategy, meaning how they're going to have ads and what the ads will say, what the titles will be, what the messages will be. And they can have a brand strategy, a, a very a, excellent example of a successful brand strategy is Nike. Nike has the swish, swash, and the yes, <laughs> and they also have the just do it. So the minute you see that, you know it's Nike. That is a very successful brand strategy. And of course, from all of these derive the social media strategies. Now in the globalization, our chain is a lot simpler. We go from the globalization for us, this means what are the requirements and the compliances that we have to adhere to in order to have a successful product in the various countries? That will then mean that the globalization experts of the company or managers, they are going to work with engineers mostly and they are going to adapt the product and the software in such a way as to be able to be you, um, a template for all the other countries. So what does that mean? Let's take an example of an address. Your address here in China, do you think it is exactly the same as an address in the US? No. no. So when an engineer is creating the fields where you put in your address in three different lines, and an American person comes in and tries to put their address in the same three lines, that cannot work. So immediately the product breaks, or the information of the US address does not transfer to the database. So the information is lost, the registration is done. So if somebody was trying to buy something, and the address is not correct, they're never going to receive it. Okay? This is where internationalization comes in. So these engineers have already got a list, and we have a few slides that uh, we're going to go later on. A list of all those things that they already know are going to be different. And they have to apply all of these to make it as generic as possible. Who of you have heard the term plain English or simple English? Very good. So what this means is that instead of using a language in English which is appropriate for the audience or the intention, you're trying to use a simpler version that then would be appropriate for larger audiences. Well, think about internationalization the same way. You're trying to create a generic template that will be very easy then to put a Chinese address the same way you put an Indian address and a US address. So this is all taken care as part of the globalization requirements and strategy. Then we have the localization strategy. This is uh, where the various local people become your brand's ambassadors. They come to the general office, to the head office, and they say that for our country, for our locale, we need to have something different. And there are many examples of uh, some of these. Uh, for example, 
McDonald's. If McDonald's is in um, India, do you think that they should be doing hamburgers? <laughs> exactly. So this is the job of the localization. And it's not just the language, but it's the cultural adaptation that needs to be done to the product. So now, we don't have a digital product in the case of McDonald's, but we have their regular products that need to be adapted. So you get the picture now where localization comes in. And finally, we have the translation and the languages. Now, languages are very important, but not all languages are equally important when it comes to a company strategy. So, of course, the number one factor is where they sell more of their product. That is the one that they're going to put a lot of money in because there is return. However, there are other languages that may be in the vicinity that they may decide to put in the same tier, although they don't have the same um, uh, sales in that country, but it's very easy for them either to understand the language or to adapt the language, and they don't have to adapt other things, for example, the address, or other things that you know are part of the regional understanding, in which case they call it the tiers. So they have various languages of importance. So for example, they would say that Chinese, English, French, German, and um, Spanish are the most important languages for this organization. Therefore, they are our tier one languages. Okay? Then they have the tier two languages, which are languages that they may not translate absolutely everything but they will have a presence there. Therefore, they need to have some marketing translation, they need to have some product localization and translation, but not all the features, not all the products. They, these would be our tier two languages. And then we move on to other languages where they want to go into these countries. There is a little bit of activity in these countries um, but there isn't much generating sales to justify them spending money to adapt the product and to translate and localize, but at the same time they keep their eye on them and they start having small translations, maybe with um, um, some partners, some distributors, and these we would call the tier three languages because they will be developed hopefully in the future. So that is the concept of tiering, uh, the tiers in the language. And uh, the reason I'm bringing it to you now is because for organizations, this is very important. It's part of the strategy. And when you speak with a client and they say, we are only interested in our tier one languages, then you should ask immediately, what are these languages? What are your tier one languages? So you speak the same language with them. Now, again, this is uh, not something that you will need, but again, it's important for you to start understanding the concept of globalization. So it's, why, it's how the global corporate strategy is being created. And you can see that uh, we've created here this uh, little diagram, and depending on where each company is, is export important or is a transnational strategy more important? Is it a multi-domestic strategy more important? And at what combination of the two? So an organization can come to this graph and then put themselves in a dot somewhere in between all of them and they will have a little bit of need of each of them. Depending on, on where they are in this graph, they will have either a high need of local responsiveness, which is what we call localization, or they will have a high need for global integration. That would need that they mean that they want their product to be as unified as possible in as many countries as possible. Okay? So these are two different strategies that companies can go. So on the one uh, are products that cannot function in any other way other than being localized. And on the other hand, you have products 
that are better off functioning in a unified way across the border. So for example, some network software may be better to be unified. Therefore, we have a higher need for global integration as opposed to social media platforms that need to have a very high need for local responsiveness. Okay? And again, this is not something that you will need personally, but when you're speaking with your clients or when you are given a product to localize, you can start understanding where this company is going to. There are many elements to a product globalization. So the first thing is the investment. The company has to pay a lot of money and it's not just the money that they pay to create the local product, it's the money they have to pay for distributors, for partners, for compliance, for licenses, and that's just to start being able to sell that product in another country. There, there are digital products now that you can only have them in a country if you have a local server. These are all considerations, financial considerations that the companies have to think about. Finally, well, next is the product. The product may be easily localizable because they had some great engineers who were actually doing a great job internationalizing the product properly, or it may have so many bugs and so many difficulties into localizing it because they used 10 different engineers and they each used different languages and different styles. So like language, engineering software and engineering program is very much um, a, a something that can be different from one programmer to the other. Do they have partners? How much is going to cost them to have partners? Do they have local offices? If they have local offices, do these people know marketing? Can they help with the product globalization? Can they depend? Can they give them back information that is valuable? Do they have customers? And if they have customers, have these customers come through which channels? Did they come from the internet? Or did they come um, from a, a distributor? And finally, what are the licenses and the agreements that they have to follow with governments? And finally, the legal and financial compliance. You need to have an export license and an import license. All of these are things that have to be taken into consideration even before. Now, why is this important? The companies now, in their globalization strategy, have globalization managers, and this is exactly their job. So they facilitate the companies uh, when they are talking about expansion, and they identify one or two countries then they have to do all of these and help them. So I call it the orchestra, the globalization, the product globalization orchestra. Because a globalization manager has to speak a different language to different <coughs> colleagues within the same organization. So he needs to speak financial terms with the finance department. So he needs to present facts and figures <laughs> why do we need to globalize or why do we need to localize in this specific country? What are the costs that it's going to take us to get this product selling in this country? And what is the return on that investment? Are we going to make those sales? That's what the financial people want to hear. The marketing people, on the other hand, they want to see about who the audience is going to be. So the globalization manager now suddenly has to start speaking a different language. They have to start saying, well, the demographics of this country are so and so, and we are looking to have a target audience of this age group, let's say 18 to 28, and this age group does not speak English or speaks English or speaks Chinese, and so on and so forth. They need to give the demographics. The, the, this information is readily available to marketeers, by the way. Now, on top of that, when you have the demographics 
of who are your potential sales you know, people, your customers, you adjust your message to them. And this is important because a lot of products fail because of marketing. If they have not understood the cultural um, significance of different people, uh, then we do have a problem and it fails. Thank you. Then we have the salespeople. The salespeople only care about money. <laughs> and all they care is that they have large amounts of customers to their name so they can get their award. <laughs> and uh, we need to speak to them in that language. We need to say to them to understand that for you to be able to have the sales you need, you need then to come and help us understand the culture and tell us all the information. What is the feedback from your customers? What do they tell you? Sales is very important for globalization because they are the people who bring the feedback. And then the marketeers adjust their um, uh, message. The product is everything we do. We work with the engineers. We work with the manufacturing. We work with all of uh, the, the people involved in the product creation, even the product packaging. Um, finally, we have human resources. A company that has employees in many countries will have to communicate with these employees in all these countries. And they're going to ask the globalization manager to adjust the cultural, to, to bring some advice. The technology is very important. Technology works in one country and it doesn't work in the other country. It is the technology people that are going to help us make sure that our product works. And finally, the operations, whether this is manufacturing, whether this is testing, whatever it is, operations is very important because this is where all the adaptations happen. And we, the globalization manager, has to make sure that all the things that they will propose can happen. So why localize a product? There are many, many good reasons. Uh, the very first, we all know, we all want to increase sales, right? <laughs> and that means we want to have bigger market share, we want to have bigger revenue, and finally we want to uh, improve our user experience, which means we want to make sure we don't say something wrong. We want to mitigate the risk so of you know all the bad stories we've heard of localization we want to create a customer report we want to get feedback and we also want loyal customers so the only way we can have loyal customers is by giving it to them in their own language that they understand and we also want to have a brand awareness we want for example nike to be known everywhere in the world which means we want to strengthen our global presence. Now, when glo globalization managers make decisions, along with the financial people, they depend on numbers. And there are many different ways of looking at numbers. If you look at this chart, on the, uh, the chart, it shows that Chinese that the language is spoken in the world. So let's start always by the title, spoken in the world. 20% Chinese, 19% English, 7% Spanish, and about 3% Hindi. Now, when we look at figures, which I haven't shared because it was too complicated to share the other graph, what are the languages that are on the internet, we have a completely different figure. We now have, again, Chinese and English as being you know, the top dominant two. But suddenly, we have Spanish being in third place and Hindi not even being there. So there is a big difference in what it is. Because in Hindi, there may be a lot of people speaking the languages, but not a lot of them are on the internet. So if we have a digital project, would it be beneficial to, global, to localize it into Hindi before we localize it into English? Yes or no? No. Exactly. 
So we need to look at the numbers and we need to use critical thinking. Somebody at the opening ceremony said critical thinking is important. Critical thinking is important in everything in life, but most importantly in business. So when you are given a set of figures, the first thing you find out is what are these figures? Where did they come from? What do they represent? And what does this mean for my product? Okay? And you may find a completely different picture. So the language industry around the world is not very different than what it is in China. It is a sector dedicated to the language, to translation, oral, and written. It includes services, it includes teaching, it includes academia, it includes the client side, the people who buy translation. It's very, very similar. We say that the estimation of the language services in the West and uh, this includes some figures in China as well, only the ones that were available, is about $46 billion. But this is, again, you use your judgment. How did this figure come to be, $46 billion? So when I looked in it, I saw that it was only for companies that are public. Therefore, they have to declare the revenue. Well. How many companies are there in China that are not public and you can never see their revenue? I presume thousands, right? Well, the same everywhere in the world. So if this figure of 46 billion is only of companies that you or anybody can see their revenue, it means that all the ones we can't see their revenue must be adding up to a lot more than 46 billion. <laughs> now, in addition to that, we're not talking about all the countries. We're talking about North America, Europe, China, perhaps Japan, the bigger countries where there is ways of checking this revenue. Well, how can you check revenue of a translation company, no matter how big it is, in, let's say, Zimbabwe? You can't. So there could be a, a huge company as big as Lionbridge. I doubt it, but I'm just exaggerating for an example that we don't know about. Therefore, again, using our judgment, we can say that our industry is at least 46 billion worth, at least. <laughs> a big thing about uh, our industry is ISO standards. Uh, there was a time that uh, um, we were considered to be a cottage industry. It is the ISO standards that made us become more important and to be part of the larger business environment and be accepted. So how many of you know about ISO standards? Again, very few. So I'll just go very, very briefly. Um, ISO standards are a, a set of guidelines that are designed to be international and are designed for companies to follow them in order to show compliance with the general laws uh, of quality. So although it doesn't guarantee the quality and it does not guarantee the compliance, it shows that this company is aware that there are certain guidelines they need to follow. So we have translation standards. And these are very important because in the West, you can't get through the door to bid for a company's work unless you are certified with ISO standards. And if a Chinese company, a language service provider, is going to go and bid for business outside China, one of the things that they will find is the ISO standards. So they will have at some point to do some ISO standards. Um, I won't go further into that because ISO standards could be a whole day on its own. But let's talk about universities. There are, uh, I know there are a lot in, in um, universities for language with language departments in China, but we don't know how many there are around the world. Um, in Translation Commons, we recently undertook a, a project to find out all the universities, including China, just to have a list of what are the universities that have language departments? We don't know. So we know the ones, the famous ones, 
the ones that have master's degrees, the ones that everybody knows. But we don't know of small departments. I recently talked with some African people in Kenya, and they told me that there are at least 10 universities in Kenya with language departments. Well, I would have known, or I would have thought there were one or two. So we have undertaken to create that list. Now, why am I put putting it here? I think this is a very important um, uh, element of our industry. If our education is so much geared up towards languages, it means that the whole world is paying attention. And we need to make more. That's our opportunity, as I said earlier. And finally, let's talk about the number of languages. Now, there's about 7,000 languages in the atlas of uh, languages. And a lot of them are not important for business. And therefore, they're in nobody's radar. But they are important to the people who speak it, and of course to the older generation that want to pass down the cultural elements of their language, teach the language. There's a richness, and I think that is why UNESCO has created the International Year of Indigenous Languages, so we all become more aware of the value of all the languages that have made us up to who we are today. So finally, we're in the product globalization cycle. <laughs> this is a, a, the product life cycle of a digital product. And of course, if you remember very briefly uh, the uh, professor from Penn State in the video, he, meant, he, he mentioned that globalization was made possible by containers and shipping. <laughs> Well, this is the past. The second wave of globalization is digital. So this is what we're talking about now. And that's why we're focusing on digital products here. So we have the product, which is the concept. And to create that from the idea, we need to design it. So there are engineers, um, user experience experts, uh, uh, financial people, there's a whole team in the company that needs to be part of the design to design a product that works, that is financially viable, that can be basically manufactured, that is useful, and that has an appeal to people to buy. So that is the product design cycle. Then we have the product development. So okay, we, we know how it should be, we gotta now Create it. And this is where a lot of problems start because what we have in our mind doesn't always translate and we come up with all sorts of technical problems. But that, that cycle of product development is where we solve all these problems. And then we have the product testing and the quality assurance. Okay? This is how it goes. Then it goes to product localization. From product localization for the different countries, it will move, it will become a local product, it will be tested for the locale, and will do the, the quality assurance. This is before it's gone to the market, of course. Then we will do the local <coughs> marketing localization. And finally, we can say the life cycle is finished, we are now ready. So on the one side you see phase one, which is everything to do with development and creating the product, this is exactly the space where the engineers have got to start thinking international sales. And what does that mean? So if you create a product which only caters for English, you know, left to right <coughs> writing, how are you going to sell your product in Israel? where the writing is right to left. So all of these things are important to do at the design stage. You know which countries you're going to go to. You cater for that flexibility. Okay? Now, it is not at this stage that they will do it. It is at this stage that they will do a generic field that will cater for both types of writing. Okay? So that's internationalization. It's not doing the different types of it, it's 
catering for a generic field. Further down at phase two, when they start localizing, the localization engineers are going to create for the locale that for Israel, they're going to take that field which is empty and generic and they will make it specific for the script to be right to left. Okay? So that's the difference between internationalization and localization and each of the two phases are in different areas of the product life cycle but they're equally important. Now, are you following so far? Yes. yes. Okay. I am so happy. <laughs> now, here's some more details about internationalization. So, at its core, it means that you gather all the elements that might change. You don't know if they're going to change, <clears throat> but from experience, you know that this potentially could be different. And then when you localize it, you need to be able to extract in a single, easily editable place. Now, my favorite term, my favorite one is to see why you should internationalize before you localize, consider the alternative. I really like this statement. Localizing a, a totally non-internationalized application means creating a copy of the code base and hunting through it file by file, function by function to find and replace everything which needs to be localized. It is possible, but really it is so painstaking that nobody would want to do that. So if the alternative is something that's going to take a full year to do, well, you've lost a year of sales in this industry. So internationalization is the aspect that's going to help you localize a product easily. Here are some things that are important. Legal requirements and compliance are different from one country to the other. So when you are doing at the bottom of the website, all your users and this and, and you know, your, your user agreements, and all of these other things, you need to be in compliance with the country. That means that you need to have enough space allocated for different countries to say different things. Um, cultural context, certain colors, icons, images are not at all good in other countries. They signify something which is going to create risk for the product. The writing systems are all different. Uh, upper cases, lower cases, caps, uh, hyphenation, spellings, all of these things are aspects of internationalization that the engineers need to be aware when they're creating it to allow the space for something to be created differently. Name orders. For example, um, in the US we will say always the first name first and the last name last. So if the field just says name and you put your both names there, nobody will know which one is your first and which one is your last. So an internationalization solution is to always put first name, last name, instead of just name, and that you separate the two. So when those two fields go into two different databases, in, in one database they go in two different fields. So when you're pulling up the name as a user, for example, in a country where the last name has to be given first, you will pull up the second field first. That is what localization do, does. It'll go there and say, no, first we need the second field for the last name, and then we put the first name field. Okay? We have different ways of sorting and collating items. And when we sort things through, internationalization needs to be very generic. Uh, the same thing about date, time, and numbers. For example, in one country, a comma signifies um, um, it, it, when you want to <laughs> decimals. That's the word I'm looking for. And in another country, it doesn't. So it can confuse people. 
So these are the internationalization aspects that an engineer may be writing two fields with a dot in the middle, and you write, you know, the $20 dot 20 cents. If that dot is there, that is not going to mean anything um, to Europe, for example, that it needs to be a comma. And because it's part of the hard code, you cannot change it. So it's better to have it simple and generic, so each country then can put either a comma or a dot. Measurements are different. We talk about kilograms here, but nobody knows kilograms in the US. They talk about pounds. Um, uh, we talk about Celsius here, but in the States it's Fahrenheit. So all of these things need to be very generic. Um, so you allow space and fields to be localized later on. Columns are different. Um, we have special characters for language. Unicode mm -hmm. is very specific. We need to cater for Unicode when we are internationalized. Even I can't say it every time. Um, you have to have always the correct code uh, of the language. Finally, we have testing and KPIs. Who knows what a KPI is? Key performance indicator. Very good. So we need to have for internationalization measurements of how well it was done. So did we lose time? Because the whole idea of internationalizing something is that you don't lose time to localize it. So you can measure time. You can measure quality. How many bugs were there once it was localized? That means the internationalization wasn't good. Or something better should have happened. Uh, how many issues? What was the cost? Cost is relevant with time and how many people worked. But cost is also how many days did we lose from the launch? If we had planned the launch you know, on the first of the month and we didn't launch for another 20 days because the product wasn't localized properly and it's all the fault of the internationalization manager, well, we do have a cost here. And finally, who's aware of pseudo-localization as a concept? Very good. So pseudo means fake. So pseudo-localization is when the internationalization engineer has finished writing their code and before they give it to anyone they say mm, let me check would this work in a different con uh, country so they put it through and they change certain things and they change the language for example the, the abbreviation and they run it through to see where the bugs are and they find a lot every time and that's why pseudo localization has become a very important aspect of uh, the product life cycle because before we even know it the localizers the internationalization engineers have already found bugs that if they hadn't done the pseudo localization we would find them later on after the translation was done and that's too late okay so by finding them early they're saving money So now we come to localization. Localization obviously refers to when we adapt the product for or application or document or content, whatever it is we adapt, to meet the cultural and language and legal requirements of a specific country. So branding needs to be culturally appropriate. So if Nike had a different branding, that was not universal, then they wouldn't be so successful. They would have to adapt it. Uh, mobile uh, looks different from in other languages. That is something we need to remember. So when you're looking at your phone with a Chinese interface and you're looking at it with a German interface, they look completely different <laughs> or Arabic. And finally, Part of the localization is to know the competition because you can't expect to localize your product in a specific way which is in line with your company when all the other successful brands say something different. So you always have to take into consideration the competition. 
So what are the things we need to localize? It's usually text, the layout, some graphics, colors, multimedia. Keyboard shortcuts are different, so we have to make sure that those are, are accounted for. Fonts are different, characters are different. The locale data, locale sets are all different. These are all aspects of localization. So now we've taken everything that was created generic and is almost empty, and we now dress it up for the country. We make it specific. And then there are aspects of the product build and process and packaging that are important to be localized. Packaging especially, because this is where a lot of import licenses, they just don't see the product, they see the package. And all the information has to be on the package when you have a physical product. In content localization, we have printed documentation, but we also have online content. Uh, we have help files, and we also have compliance that is necessary. So all of these are part of the localization manager's job. So let's talk about some challenges here. We have quality and consistency, and we know this very well from our industry, translation, linguistic. Sometimes there is an adequate source material, or it's not relevant to the country. There are accuracy issues, misleading data, there are anachronisms, uh, cultural clashes, whether it's tradition versus modernity or whether it's inappropriate content or colors. Finally, there are some other, there's resistance to change sometimes when a culture does not accept a new product, inadequate, inadequate change management, there are conflicts in laws and regulations, um, there are skill shortages. You want to you know, sell your product in a country that you can't find salespeople. How are you going to sell your product? There are technological incompatibilities. We know very well of those. Uh, there are differences in automation. Some countries are more automated than others. And finally, there are copyright and ownership issues. So there's a lot of issues that uh, globalization needs to deal with, and that's product globalization. I'm going to share a, a kind of different globalization um, instance here. Y have you seen Inside Out? Very good. So Inside Out and Pixar worked very hard to create this film and not only to internationalize it, but to localize it as well. So they created, for example, what you see here, let's start with that is the same scene which has two different sports. So for a country where, let's say, Iceland, hockey is more important. And maybe other countries like maybe Russia, maybe Norway, or whatever. But if you go to Brazil, soccer is more important. So when you're trying to show a very famous, important, and you know, a, a sport which is part of the culture there, you want to be showing them the right thing. So they used different sports in the background. So there were 28 graphics in total in the entire film. And in this 28 graphics, they used 45 different localized versions. Now that is a lot. If it's a film, that's a lot. I'll give you another example uh, for Inside Out. There is somewhere where the character is reading a sign, and as the character reads the sign, they move their hand left to right reading the sign. Well, the Arabic version had the, the character move the other way around. Now, that is detail. That is a successful internationalization. So, how, what is the number of the internationalized uh, aspects? Anybody? What was internationalized? 28. 28 is the graphics that were internationalized. They were created as generics. And what is the number of how many were localized? 45. 
Okay? So you, you're starting to see the difference of the two concepts. Any questions? 